Okay, this is the next session. The Seven Titles of the Messiah, Session 8. And we're going to be talking about the scepter, past, present, and future. See, the scepter is indicative of the king. Ever since the split up and the decline of the nation of Israel after Solomon, the Jews have dreamed of the future when they would be the greatest kingdom in the world again. That's what the prophecies of the Old Testament say. And that nation in the future would have a king who was a descendant of David, and that king would be the Messiah, and his kingdom would be over all. One of the famous prophecies concerning this is in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2, it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountains of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it and many people shall go and say come ye let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the house of God of Jacob and he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem and he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks nation shall not lift up sword against nation neither shall they learn war any more so that's a famous prophecy the Messiah would be of the house of David and the Jews greatly anticipated this Uh, Psalm 2, the whole psalm is about this subject. Psalm 2, verse 1, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let's break their brands asunder. Let's cast away their cords from us. So, the the nation's going to be ruled by God's anointed. See, he that sits in the heavens shall laugh at them. The Lord shall have them in derision, and he shall speak unto them in his wrath, and vex them in his sore displeasure. I have set my king, which would have been the Messiah, upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. As of me, I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, ye be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling kiss the son <laughs> lest he be angry and you perish from his way from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little blessed are all they that put their trust in him so this, that's another messianic prophecy israel would one day rule the world and it would be ruled by god's son ezekiel 34 another Ezekiel 34 verse 22 Therefore I will I save my flock and they shall no more be a prey and I will judge between cattle and cattle and I will set up one shepherd over them and he shall feed them even my servant David he shall feed them he shall be their shepherd and I the Lord will be their God and my servant David a prince among them I the Lord have spoken it so here it figuratively calls that the Messiah, the, the shepherd, David, it's because he's of the house of David. Another one, Isaiah. Isaiah 11, verse 10. In that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign above, of the people, and to it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious, his place of rest. It shall come to pass in that day the Lord shall set his hand against the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left for, or remaining from Assyria, from Egypt, from Pathros, from Cush, from Elam, from Shinar, from Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. 
and he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. See, that's that lost ten tribes I was talking to you about. Um, Ezekiel 37, another one, verse 21, And say to them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and will gather them up on every side and bring them into their own land and I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel and one king shall be their king to them all and they shall be no more two nations Judah and Israel split like it was neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all verse 24 and David my servant will be their king over them and they shall have one shepherd and they shall walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them Say, and they shall dwell in the land that I have given them unto Jacob, my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt, and they shall dwell therein, even they and their children and their children's children forever, and my servant David shall be their prince forever. So it's very plain that there is going to be a future kingdom, it's going to be a Jewish kingdom on earth, and boy, the Jews dreamed of the restoration of their greatness in this fashion. They had thought they had a chance for it after Alexander the Great's empire had been divided and they had won their independence from one of the Seleucid kings. They, had, they set up the Maccabean kingdom and they thought that could grow to fulfill that prophecy but then their hopes were dashed when Pompey, the Roman general, conquered Judea in 63 B.C., Later, Rome set up Herod, that hated king, to be the ruler of Judea. But there was another prophecy in Daniel that still was not fulfilled, and they were looking forward to that. Daniel chapter 2, verse 28. So Nebuchadnezzar had this dream, and he forgot it, and then Daniel told him what the dream was. And Verse 28, But there is a God in heaven that reveals secrets and makes known to King Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed were this. As for you, O king, your thoughts came into your mind upon your bed. What should come to pass hereafter? And he that reveals secrets made known to you what shall come to pass. But as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living, but for their sakes that shall make known the interpretation of the king, and that you might know the thoughts of your heart. Thou, O king, saw and behold a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was awesome. The image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part iron and part clay. And you saw that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Then was the iron and the clay, the brass, the silver, the gold, broken into pieces together, and became like chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain, and filled the whole earth." Oh, wow, that's a vision and a half, isn't it? So, uh, now, Daniel's prophecy was very amazing because it predicted events for more than a thousand years. Here is the interpretation. Daniel 2, verse 36. This is a dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, and for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field, and the fowls of the heaven, hath he given unto thine hand, and he hath made thee ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. This was in 604 B.C. After thee shall rise another kingdom inferior to thee, Persia, 539 B.C. And another third kingdom of brass, Alexander the Great, 334 B.C., which shall rule 
bear rule over all the earth, and the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron. This is Rome, 133 BC approximately. For as much as iron breaks in pieces and subdues all things, and as iron that breaketh all these shall break in pieces and bruise, and whereas thou saw the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. The Roman Empire split in 285 A.D. But there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou saw iron mixed with miry clay. As the toes of the feet were part iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And that's true. The Eastern Roman Empire was much stronger, and soon the Western side succumbed to invasion by the barbarians. Now, this gives a list of empires, and it was accurate. After Babylon came the Persian Empire, after it, Alexander the Great's Empire, and after that, the Roman Empire arose. And in another prophecy, Daniel 8, it predicted that the Empire of Greece would be split into four kingdoms, which occurred when Alexander the Great died unexpectedly, and one of the four, which turned out to symbolize Rome, and it says, By him was the daily sacrifice taken away, and the place of his sanctuary cast down. Well, that's exactly what Rome did when Titus destroyed Jerusalem and the temple in 70 AD. Now, some people maintain the fourth kingdom was the Seleucid dynasty, but that was just a kingdom. This is a, a list of empires. Now, there are skeptics who don't want to admit the possibility that these prophecies were real. And so they postulated that the book of Daniel was written much later than Daniel lived, and somebody wrote in these things to make it look like Daniel predicted them. But this, the discovery of the fragments of the book of Daniel in the Dead Sea Scrolls disproved that. So no matter how the skeptics tried, they can't get around the fact that verse 41 and 42 predict the split of the Roman Empire that occurred much later, see? (laughs) So Daniel in his prophecy is one of the prophecies that prove the strength of the Bible and the truth of God, see? But anyway, in Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, it says, And in these days, the days of the final empire, the Roman empire, in these days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall then not be left to another, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest, the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. So the stone, that's the rock, that's Jesus Christ, he is going to come during the Roman Empire, during the time of the Roman Empire. Very interesting. So, this particular prophecy was very tantalizing to those who knew about it, and when they saw that Jesus was coming, and it was during this Roman Empire, the Fourth Empire, they were really thinking, wow, is this going to come to pass? Is he going to consume all these other kingdoms? You know, has a kingdom been set up that shall never be destroyed? Has it broken in pieces, all those other kingdoms? Well, has it happened? No, not yet. See? Now, that's that's a problem. Because, you know, some people think, you know, it, um, they don't understand that prophecies can have be parts of them. They don't understand biblical prophecy. They, they think of it in their terms. But it's a problem until you understand how prophecies work. Because, you know, if the prophecy is not true, what's the Bible say? You're supposed to disqualify the prophet. Well, I don't think Daniel's disqualified. See, But there's been several solutions that scholars have proposed to address this issue. Some of them have rejected the authority of the Bible altogether. All right, uh, Some maintain that Jesus wasn't the Messiah. Uh, so these weren't fulfilled. Others say that Christ's kingdom was spiritual and it doesn't count. 
but brothers are saying that elements of this are still future. And you know, you can you can Google this stuff on the internet. You can find dozens of different timelines of future events regarding this the prophetic kingdoms who insist they're the ones who have decoded the prophecy. Uh, I mean, you, you can find all kinds of stuff. Prophecy is is often murky and contains symbolic language. And of course, it's complicated further by the differences in language and culture that have intervened between us and when Daniel spoke it. See, prophecies often have facets that can be taken several different ways. But all the different timelines and things you can find out on the internet, all those different things can't be right. I mean, no matter how insistent and convincing their supporters are. Because, you know, with prophecy, when things finally do come to pass, that's when we really see what the original meaning was. So, uh, I take a pragmatic approach to this, regarding all this prophecy stuff. Because, you know, they're going to come to pass in spite of what I do, or what anyone else does. So, you know what I do? I, I ignore the doomsayers altogether. I mean, if we're living right, won't we be okay with God? I mean, if we're genuine, why should knowing what's coming change how we should live every day? I mean, shouldn't we live every day like Christ is coming back tomorrow, but plan like it's not happening for a hundred years? <laughs> Anything else is kind of hypocritical if you really think about it. See, I think that these prognosticators are appealing to people's laziness and uncertainty. Take this shortcut for it's going to be an advantage. Well, why don't you be genuine all the time? And then you'll really be blessed. (laughs) Isn't that the best way to live? You know, it's sort of like all these frequent predictors of financial crises. (laughs) They're a dime a dozen. Now, of course, sooner or later, there is going to be a downswing. It's, It's inevitable that it will occur. That's the natural ebb and flow of the market, bulls and the bears. So when that does happen, then the one guy whose timing was right with his prediction, he'll be able to say, see, I told you so, and hope we forget about all those other attempts of his that were wrong. (laughs) See, there are two big flaws in the teachings of many of the religious organizations which emphasize kingdom prophecy because they don't understand dispensationalism and the great mystery. So what does this all have to do with Scepter? I told you, some of the titles point at his his first coming, and some of the titles point at his second, and the title of Scepter is sort of quasi in the middle, because it has an involvement in both. See, there's a fork in the road, a contingency with the king, based upon circumstances. See? Now, is this contingency what God really intended? And this is, Now, this is where things get really interesting. Because, like I said, I believe that the Jews, if they had accepted Jesus as the Messiah, there would have been no gap, and they would have gone straight into the glory events prophesied for the kingdom. And that was part of the trap that was set for the adversary. <laughs> Okay, because he didn't know the mystery. So the adversary was in a position where he was damned if he didn't kill Jesus, and he was damned if he did. Because if he didn't kill Jesus, then he figured that Jesus would go on and establish the kingdom. So, since he didn't know the mystery, he didn't know the other option, and so he took that kill Jesus option. But the key question is, what did Jesus believe? I think there's an important clue regarding that in the Gospel of Mark. Take a look at Mark 13. Mark 13. Jesus is talking about the future in Mark 13, verse 26. And it says, And then shall he see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. For then shall he send his angels and shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When her branch is yet tender and put forth leaves, you know that the summer is near. So ye in like manner, when you shall see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh even at the doors. Verily I say to you, that this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words will not pass away. 
but of that day and of that hour knows no man. No, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. So Jesus said, I don't know when this is going to happen. See, he himself clearly said, I don't know when the end times will happen. Why? Well, obviously, his father had not yet told him. Well, why was that? (laughs) Well, maybe it wasn't a done deal. Okay, maybe the contingency was still active. See, because why else would Jesus instruct his disciples to pray for the kingdom to come if it wasn't possible for it to come? See, I think Jesus really sincerely believed that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. See, there's a good possibility it was eminent. See, now we already have seen from the other prophecies that there was a kingdom in the future that the Messiah would rule from, and this kingdom would be on earth. The word of God would be the basis for that culture, and the Jews would be the masters of the earth. They would function as priests, and they would teach about God. But the second part, the sufferings and the glory, it hasn't happened today. This is going to occur in the future, as recorded in the book of Revelation. And specifically, chapter 19 and 20. This includes the battle of Armageddon. And the armies are assembled. Revelation 16, the devil will get bound. The resurrection of the just will occur. The reign of Christ will occur. And the Jews will function as priests. Take a look at Revelation 19. Turn to Revelation 19, please. It says, I saw an angel standing in the sun. He cried with a loud voice, saying, to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, <laughs> and the flesh of all men, both free and bound, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on a horse and against his army. And the beast was taken. How would you like to be on that special ops spiritual team that does that? Somebody's going to do that. (laughs) And with him, the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image, these both were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the remnant that were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. So that's that great battle of Armageddon that was foretold. And afterwards, they're going to beat their swords and the plowshares and their spears and the pruning hooks. All right? This was the battle that a king would stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand, as predicted in Daniel. Then, Revelation chapter 20, verse 1, I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand he laid hold on the dragon the old servant which is the devil and Satan and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and put a seal on him that he should not deceive the nations anymore till the thousand years should be fulfilled and after that he'd be loosed for a little season I don't know why but (laughs) that's one of my questions and I saw thrones and they that sat on them both and judgment was given unto them and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and the word of God which had not worshipped the beast neither his image neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in, in their hands and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years that is the kingdom of heaven but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished this is the first resurrection blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection on such the second death hath no power but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years so that's the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies the kingdom of heaven upon the earth the Messiah is in charge the Jews are in charge, the whole world is run from Jerusalem. See, that that is the kingdom of heaven. So, very interesting. 
Now, that was at hand, but it didn't happen. And Jesus ascended, and it was it was held. It, it didn't happen. See? And after that, they didn't preach about the kingdom of heaven. They preached about the kingdom of God. Look at Acts chapter 1, verse 3. After Jesus raised from among the dead, for the 40 days that he was upon the earth, Acts chapter 1, verse 3 talks about this. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to what? Not the kingdom of heaven, but the kingdom of God. Woo! After this point, throughout the book of Acts, the kingdom of God is preached, not the kingdom of heaven. Acts 8.12 When they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized. See? Um, Acts 28 This is Paul in Rome. Verse 23 And when they appointed him a day, there came many unto him, unto his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses, out of the prophets, from morning until evening. Say, Look at verse 30, Acts 28, verse 30. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house, and received all that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. So, the kingdom of heaven was not preached. It was the kingdom of God. So, when when does that kingdom of heaven start? We read about it there in, Matthew, in Revelation 19. See, they would capture the servant, the beast, and all that. And then the kingdom of heaven would start. So, very interesting to see how this all felt. But see, now there there are some people say that, well, Jesus was called a king. He was called a king, so wasn't there a kingdom in the gospel period? But let's take a look at this. Let's I bet you think that he was called a king a whole lot. Well, actually, he wasn't. Not a whole lot. See, in Matthew chapter 2, verse 2, the wise men asked, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? See, it's very interesting. It says, it actually reads, Where is he who has been born? (laughs) So, the wise men arrived in Jerusalem after Jesus was born. They didn't show up at the manger, you know, when Jesus was born. They came later. But where is he that is, has been born king of the Jews? Well, wait a minute. Has any infant ever ruled as a king? See, it, this has to be in the sense of born to one day be king. I mean, no king has ever ruled since they were born. I mean, Jesus couldn't rule before, before he could even speak, could he? See, in, in the Old Testament, the, the youngest king was Josiah. He was eight years old. The reason for that is because um, Jezebel's daughter, Athaliah, who had been queen, killed all the other sons that were related to David, you know, the sons of the prior king, except high, the high priest hid Josiah and preserved the Christ line. So the youngest king in the Old Testament was eight years old. So I think he was called king in anticipation. Uh, at the beginning of his ministry also, Nathaniel called him king. And John one forty nine, Nathaniel answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. See? But Jesus had just begun to, to declare the kingdom was at hand. It had not yet happened. I mean, can you have a king without a kingdom? Well, not a recognized official one. Uh, it could be in exile or whatever. But see, right after the miracles of the loaf and the fish, uh, there was a draft Jesus as king movement in John 6. 
verse 14 and 15. But did Jesus go along with it? John 6, 14. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet, that should come into the world. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain alone. Right? So he he didn't approve of it. He went and hid. (laughs) Okay? Then, of course, at his entries into Jerusalem, they called him king. Hosanna in the highest, the king of Israel. Right? Um, And there's a prophecy, John chapter 12, verse 14. Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereupon, as was written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, thy king comes, sitting on an ass's colt. But, verse 16, these things understood not his disciples at the first. But when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they these things that were written of him, that he had done these things unto them. So, did Jesus become king then? No. Instead, the, the Jews crucified him. Now, they mockingly called him king during the trials and crucifixion. I, I mean, they even used it to pressure Pilate in John 19.12 it says from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him but the Jews cried out saying if you let this man go you are not Caesar's friend whosoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar they were trying to get Pilate to crucify Jesus because they said that Jesus said he was a king but when Pilate confronted Jesus In John 18.33, Pilate entered into the judgment hall again. He called Jesus and said to him, Are you king of the Jews? And Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell thee of me? (laughs) Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? (laughs) Your own nation and chief priests have delivered you unto me. What have you done? Verse 36, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Well, what does the phrase not of this world mean? Well, get it in accordance. Look it up. John 8, 23. He said, to them, you are from beneath, I am from above, you are of this world, I am not of this world. John twelve twenty five, He that loves his life shall lose it, and he that hates his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. John twelve thirty one, Now is the judgment of this world, now shall the prince of this world be cast out. John thirteen one. look at this. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. So Jesus told Pilate that his kingdom was not of this world. It was from heaven. Okay. Well, did he mean then that the kingdom of heaven was in effect? No. Because he also told Pilate, But now is my kingdom not from hence, from that place. So now it's not from heaven. It hadn't come yet. It was still future. See? Wow. So then Pilate said to him, verse 37, Well, are you a king then? Jesus answered and said, You say that I'm a king. To this end was I born. For this cause came I in the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Every one that is of the truth hears my voice. And then, you know, Pilate famously said, What is truth? Wow. So then, of course, Pilate, he said, Look, there's a custom. I I let somebody go at Passover. So who do you want me to release to you? Should I release to you the king of the Jews? And of course, this was had to have been said sarcastically. So, Jesus didn't say that he was the king, did he? That was anticipated. He would be the king in the future. See? How about in the epistles? 
I bet it's all over the place. No, it's not. It's very significant that Jesus is not called king in any of Paul's epistles. I mean, I think that if that title was in effect, it'd be all over. But it's not all over, okay? In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15 and 16, here it does say, king of kings, but let's see who it's talking about. 1 Timothy 6, verse 15 and 16. It says, which in his times he shall, he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Is this Jesus? Read on. Who only hath immortality. Did Jesus die? Yes. So this is not talking about Jesus. It's talking about God. Dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man has seen nor can see, whom, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. They sure saw Jesus. See, God was a king. In, we saw that in the Old Testament. He was a Lord. We saw that in the Old Testament. Sure, it's possible that they can both share that title. You know? First, Second Peter chapter 1, verse 10. It says, Wherefore, the rather of brethren, give, calling, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, you shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, it was future still. Uh, we can, If we had more time, we'd look at some of the other occurrences of kingdom in the New Testament. There's just a few more, but they're all future tense. They're all future tense. So, the kingdom of God comes to pass in the future in the book of Revelation. And in the last minute or two here before we close, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what some people believe otherwise. Because I think it's very clear The kingdom of God is different from the kingdom of heaven. I think what Bollinger said about it is accurate. And the kingdom of heaven has not yet happened. So, the focus of the title of scepter could have happened had everyone believed and accepted Jesus as the Messiah. There was that contingency plan. But it did not occur And so the kingdom of heaven did not happen, and it won't happen until the future when Revelation 19, Jesus comes and conquers the the world and becomes the king of the kingdom of heaven upon the earth. But some of the other people who do not believe this, there's various other interpretations of that. Uh, One of the things that is you need to know about is something called restoration theology or kingdom theology or dominion theology or kingdom now theology all variations of this thing see the genuine is that Jesus will return and then set up a kingdom okay but these other things restoration theology, kingdom theology, kingdom now theology, dominion theology are all ideas where man can attempt to precipitate this kingdom before Jesus comes. See, uh, they believe that Satan still has the dominion of the world, but we men who are Christians now because of the power we have from Christ, they believe that we can take that dominion back. And then we can hasten the time of Jesus' coming. (laughs) See? But in order for that to happen, they're going to have to unify Christianity. They're going to have to set up a unified hierarchy. Uh, They're going to have to have new modern apostles. And these new modern apostles are going to have to have new revelations to exhort authority and then 
after the church takes dominion of the world it's going to need to cleanse the earth and then after that the earth will be ready for the return of Christ well, that is not true we've seen from the prophecies that you know I mean it's the antichrist that's going to <laughs> that's going to unify the world you know and and the kings of the future are going to be giving their power to the beast and the false prophet and then what's going to happen Jesus is going to come in and conquer what they have unified see so Christ will destroy the beast and take control of the world that way so it's not going to be that we do it in any way shape or form you see (laughs) <laughs> in Luke 17 he, Jesus was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come and in Luke 17 verse 20 Jesus said something real interesting he said the kingdom of God comes not with observation well I thought he said you have to watch for it but it doesn't come with observation you're watching for it won't make it happen okay so the kingdom of heaven is going to happen when it happens and it will happen on God's timetable and no one is going to be the finger of God to make that occur I mean that's what Judas tried to do he tried to be the finger of God I think to make Jesus get cornered and then come out fighting well throughout history everyone who's tried to be the finger of God has had the hand of God against them and that's what I think that this kingdom now and dominion now stuff is no God is going to make that happen on his own timetable and nobody is going to help him do it so that's the information on king and scepter And then we'll see you next week for Rock and then a little treat at the end. So, love you much. Bless you.